Thank you for joining us. Today's webinar is titled Family Physicians in Rural America, Training, Distribution, and Scope of Practice. And our presentation features Dr. Lars Peterson from the Rural and Underserved Health Research Center and Dr. Davis Patterson from the WAMI Rural Health Research Center. Today's webinar is brought to you by the Rural Health Research Gateway, which is funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Please note that all attendees have been muted, but you may submit your questions for our speakers using the chat box function. Today's session will be recorded and posted to the Gateway website for later viewing. A brief Q&A will follow today's presentation. Next slide, please. My name is Per Ostmo, and I am the Program Director for the Rural Health Research Gateway. My contact email is pear.ostmo at und.edu, and I will make sure to drop my email in the chat box. So if you have any questions about Gateway, please reach out to me. Next slide, please. So what does Gateway do? We provide easy and timely access to research conducted by the Rural Health Research Centers which are funded by the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy. Gateway efficiently puts new findings and information in the hands of our subscribers, which include policymakers, educators, public health employees, hospital staff, and many more. Gateway is timely, relevant, and 100% free. Following today's presentation, I will provide a brief demonstration of how to access research on Gateway and how to stay up to date on the latest rural health research. Next slide, please. And now I'll hand things off to our presenters, Dr. Lars Peterson and Dr. Davis Patterson. All right, thank you for that, Pear. Um, I'll get things started. As Pear mentioned, I'm Lars Peterson. I'm the Vice President of Research at the American Board of Family Medicine and also um, Associate Professor of Family Community Medicine um, at the University of Kentucky, where I'm affiliated with the Rural Health Research Center. And um, my partner, Davis Patterson uh, from the University of Washington and the Whammy Rural Health Research Center will present today on what Pear already said is family physicians in rural America, training distribution and scope of practice, but not necessarily in that order. Um, next slide, Davis. So kind of an overview of today's talk, um, a little bit about who we are, which I think has already been covered. And then we're gonna review recent research findings much of which you can find on the gateway, um, looking at the supply and distribution of uh, clinicians in rural areas, including family physicians, and then a little bit about what they do there. And then also looking at residency training with some uh, findings that Davis and I have been collaborating on that are not quite out yet. So you get a look, um, kind of early look of things that are in the works. And then I'll review uh, scope of practice of family physicians in rural areas and how that's been changing over time and save some time for some Q&A from the audience. And Davis, back to you for this next slide. Thanks, uh, Lars, and thank you, uh, Pear and the Rural Health Research Gateway for uh, inviting us to talk today about our work. Um, so I'm the director of the Whammy Rural Health Research Center, as well as Rural Prep, which I'll say something more about what that is in a minute. And I just wanted to uh, acknowledge um, it takes a village to do research, and we're presenting a number of studies. Uh, so uh, my collaborators include folks um, at the University of Washington uh, Department of Family Medicine, where I'm located, as well as uh, Randy Longenecker at Ohio University, Dave Schmidt at University of North Dakota, uh, and Lars, our, my co-presenter, uh, and Zach Morgan from the American Board of Family Medicine. And Lars, did you want to? Yeah, and then about our, your team. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely does take a village, as Davis said. So um, at the Rural Health Research Center, so the findings we're, present, findings we're presenting today um, involved a, a team as well. And Ty Borders is the director of the University of Kentucky Rural Health, Rural and Underserved Health Rural and Underserved Health Research Center. I will get that right one of these days. Um, and then some other staff at the ABFM, including Bo Fang, um, Zach Morgan, have ran a lot of these data and really. Um, done a good job of understanding the data and also, as you can see, helping uh, with the other studies. And then Vashish uh, was actually a general surgery resident who worked with us um, during his kind of research year 
on one of the studies I'll talk about, and Rouge um, is uh, an undergraduate. Well, she's graduated now and is applying for med school. So hopefully she's, she is getting interviewed now and hopefully will get accepted soon and did some great work with us too. And uh, next slide, Davis. And then as, as mentioned, uh, a lot of the work we're talking about or presenting today uh, has been funded by HRSA through the Rural, through the rural Health Research um, Centers. So the first one that I'm affiliated with, as I mentioned, uh, Ty Borders is the, um, oh my gosh, the PI or the director of the center. And the focus of the Rural and Underserved Health Research Center um, is to seek, you know, to advance understanding of the effective means of organizing health services, facilitating access and improving population health in rural America, particularly with a focus on economically disadvantaged areas. And it has a wide range of um, affiliated investigators at the University of Kentucky and also a few outside of the university and from a wide range of disciplines. It's been um, really good work with them. And I'll turn to Davis. Yes, and uh, um, so the WAMI stands for the five state region that our medical uh, school serves, but our work is really national in scope. So, um, so we are, the WAMI Rural Health Research Center is also one of the federal uh, four funded uh, rural health research centers around the country. And our mission is to improve and sustain rural health through research that engages policymakers, planners, and practitioners in advancing equity and rural access to care. Uh, and the health workforce is one of our main areas of focus um, and particularly education and training of uh, rural health professionals. Um, and then I wanna mention something about rural prep, which um, was is also funded by um, HRSA through the Bureau of uh, Medicine or the Division of Medicine and Dentistry. And um, it's a five year, well now six year project. Um, and our research there is specifically focused on education and training of rural primary care clinicians. And so, um, so I'm gonna be uh, including some work uh, there because it's very relevant to this topic of family, uh, rural family physicians. Yeah. And then um, I, I I need to issue this disclaimer because we are funded by the federal government that um, our funder doesn't endorse um, any of the content that we're going to present today, um, but um, they, uh, we're very appreciative of, of their support um, and they, um, I think, very much do uh, uh, have been interested in and help to um, um, set the research direction for many of the, the projects that we're going to um, um, present today. So I just wanted to uh, issue the disclaimer and acknowledge the, the grateful, uh, our, our gratitude for that funding. And that's across our three centers. And, and then a word, since most, a lot of the data you're going to hear about came from the American Board of Family Medicine, I just want to give a brief mention to the ABFM. Um, as I talked to Pear about in the um, kind of IT check before the webinar started. We are in Lexington, Kentucky, um, have been since we were founded in 1969. Um, we were a member of the American Board of Medical Specialties or ABMS. We're a member board of them. So there's 24 primary boards um, and we are the primary certifying body for allopathic physicians, even though we do uh, certify a number of osteopathic physicians as well. We are the third largest board um, currently, as of last week, 101,000 plus uh, certificate holders or diplomates as we refer to them. And the mission of the ABFM is really to improve the health of the public by ensuring that family physicians have the requisite knowledge, attitudes, and skills to provide high quality care. And so to help understand that mission, and if we're meeting it, particularly through our certification program, and uh, using the data we have to understand what's happening in primary care and with family physicians in specific, we have had a research department for over nine years. Um, and then we've collected data since the 1980s, um, at least the 1980s, maybe earlier, on examination registration when physicians sign up to take the certification exam out of residency and then the continuing certification examination um, kind of at the earliest seven to 10 years and then continuing on every seven or 10 years, depending on the time frame um, after that into their 60s, 70s, and even 80s. And then some other data you'll hear about, um, about six years ago, or starting in 2016, we started administering um, a survey to graduates who were three years from residency training in conjunction with the Family Medicine Residency Directors Organization to provide feedback on the outcomes of graduate training to family medicine to improve training, hopefully, and Davis will cover those outcomes 
And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Davis, to get us started. Great, thank you. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to start by um, giving an overview of the landscape of the supply and distribution of the family uh, physician workforce in rural and urban areas. And this uh, work comes from uh, a set of reports that we did. Uh, I guess uh, I guess they just came out last year, um, and there's a link to the reports there in the slides, which will be available to you later. Um, and so we have a national report looking at supply and distribution of primary care workforce. We also have uh, state by state profiles. Um, and so if you go to that link, you can pull down all that uh, material or just the, the profile for your state. Um, and so um, to do this work, we used um, the national provider identifier data. And so um, every clinician or nearly every clinician um, in the country um, has to have an NPI number. Um, and it's a free data source uh, available uh, on, the, on the web that you can download. And so um, using that, we can uh, find their location. Uh, and we use the urban influence codes um, to measure uh, rurality um, and uh, population data. And so uh, using the urban influence codes, we, we have a three category uh, geographic classification. So we have the metro counties, which are the urban counties, and then we have two categories of rural because we know that um, all, you know, there's variety in rural. And so, uh, so we have micropolitan counties, um, which are uh, a bit larger in population, and then the non-core counties that are smaller in population. And then the other factor that the UICs take into account is whether a county is adjacent or not to a metro county. Um, and so that goes into the, the codes as well. Um, so first off, um, I, I just wanna show this uh, national map of family physicians uh, per population per 100,000. Um, and so the gray counties here um, are the urban counties. So we're not concerned with them in this analysis. Um, and then the, all the colored counties are the rural counties in, and um, the, the deeper the red color um, the greater the concentration of family physicians. Uh, and so you can see, you know, there's some areas like uh, the New England um, area. There's kind of a, a that's, that's deep red. There's also kind of a swath of counties that runs roughly from the, you know, the upper Midwest um, down toward the, the Southwest that, that are sort of deep red, some areas of the West. Um, then there's pockets where the family physicians are not as plentiful. Um, like you can see there in North and South Dakota, uh, Eastern Montana, um, some parts of Texas, et cetera. So this is just the national uh, distribution by county. We also um, wanted to look at um, breaking into these three types of counties, um, looking at sort of the what's the national uh, distribution in, in, in a statistical sense. And um, the first thing that you notice, and by the way, so we've included in this report, not just family physicians, but others that provide primary care, including um, NPs and PAs. And so um, first thing that you notice that uh, unlike the other clinicians, family physician supply actually increases with rurality. So the more rural you, you go, um, the more uh, concentrated or plentiful family physicians actually are. Um, again, this is aggregate uh, in, in, the, in the national uh, in uh, nationally, not necessarily, you know, in every place, but, uh, but overall. The other thing um, that uh, we did was look at um, counties that do not have each one of these kinds of clinicians um, that do primary care. Um, and, and so uh, you notice, first of all, um, that uh, the low bars actually indicate greater supply. In other words, there's fewer counties that do not have family physicians, do not have NPs, or, or do not have PAs compared to the internal medicine uh, physicians or the, uh, the pediatricians. Um, and so, so these are the, you know, family physicians, NPs, and PAs are the most common in rural places. Um, but um, at the same time, we do notice that as you get more rural, um, there are more counties that do not have um, one or more uh, of these types of clinicians. So one in 10 uh, non-core counties has no family physician. 
Um, the other thing that that's important to think about is not just where they are, but what are they doing there? And we know that OB care um, is in crisis in some parts of, of rural America. Uh, and there's been a lot in the press about this. Um, and so we wanted to look at the distribution of uh, family physicians who deliver babies, as well as other clinicians in rural versus urban places. And to do this, we actually did partner with uh, Lars's organization, the American Board of Family Medicine, uh, and used their survey data. Uh, and so we, we um, uh, produced statistics and mapped as well um, where there are family physicians um, who deliver babies and where they aren't. And, and what you notice um, actually is that family physicians are the main clinician in those more remote non-core counties who deliver babies. Um, so they're really critical uh, for that, uh, the, the, um, the rural uh, OB workforce. Um, the other thing though, which is of concerning, and these are county, these are percentages of counties that don't have uh, clinicians who are delivering babies. You know, over half of rural counties have now family physicians that deliver babies. Um, and then the other thing I think that you'll um, uh, notice here um, when you look at, uh, so to the far right there, those are um, counties that have no OB services based on you know, not a single one of those clinicians to, to the left. Um, and two out of five non-core counties have no OB services or clinicians that deliver um, uh, babies. And so taken together, I think what you see is if family physicians aren't doing it in a non-core county, then nobody probably is doing it. Um, and so again, just underscoring their critical role in providing OB care. So now, um, you know, so we've looked at distribution and, and a little bit about what uh, family physicians are doing in rural areas. Um, and I wanted to talk more about, um, so how can we get more family physicians to practice in rural places? Um, and training is a really critical component of that. And so um, there's been a lot of uh, work going on in this area. The Federal Office of Rural Health Policy um, has been investing for over 10 years in rural residencies and, um, and for uh, many of the last several years, specifically through the Rural Residency Planning and Development Program. So. Um, so there's a big investment there in trying to get more rural training. And then there was recently new legislation enacted that, that creates more opportunities for rural training track residencies so that, uh, so that physicians, uh, residents can spend more time in a rural place um, learning how to take care of rural people and hopefully uh, building connections to those communities. So, um, so we wanted to find out, um, looking at rural family medicine residency programs versus urban, what are their practice outcomes? What's the yield to rural practice uh, and practice in under-resourced sites? So we, our study question uh, was, how do graduates from rural family medicine residencies compared with um, the urban residents, um, how do they compare in their practice in rural versus urban places and in practice in under-resourced settings? And uh, when I talk about a rural residency, what I mean are those programs where residents spend more than half their time in a rural location. And, and we define that um, uh, as um, meeting any two, at least two federal rural definitions to count as rural. And then uh, for this study, in, ter in terms of determining where residents practice when they, when they get out into practice, we use zip codes, um, geocoded those using the rural urban community area codes. So it's not a county level definition, it's, it's a more fine grained uh, definition of rural um, for this study. And our data source here, um, as uh, Lars was mentioning earlier, we used um, two surveys and one is the National Graduate Survey, which are, these are those uh, board certified physicians just three years into practice. Uh, and then there's the continuing certification exam uh, registration questionnaire. And so, you know, every time a physician has to recertify um, seven or so years after initial certification. Um, and so we call these the, the mid to late career uh, physicians. So, so I'll be presenting data on early career and then the mid to later career physicians. And the first thing that I wanna point out here um, is this slide just helps you to see 
you know, who are the folks, um, who are the rural versus urban program graduates? Um, what do they look like on these various characteristics? Um, and so the first thing that you can see there, um, that top row comparing graduates from rural and urban programs is um, in the early career, um, the younger physicians, there's no difference in age, that's that first row. Um, these are the proportions that were under age 40. Um, looking at the, the older physicians who are you know, in mid and late career, um, you can see that the, those who graduated from rural programs, 54% uh, of them were over age 50 uh, compared to just 46% of the urban program gra graduates. And so there's a significant difference there um, in age. The, the rural program graduates are, are a bit older. Um, there are also significant gender differences. And so greater proportions of rural program graduates in both groups uh, were men. Although you can see um, over time uh, in both rural and uh, looking at both rural and urban program graduates, um, there are more women. In other words, the proportion who are men, that's going down over time. Uh, more women are choosing uh, family medicine um, and, and medical school overall, more women are uh, becoming physicians uh, relative to the past. So, uh, but there's still a gender difference there, even with the early career uh, physicians in terms of uh, the proportion who are, are men who are going into rural practice, or I'm sorry, who, who come from rural programs. And then the third row looks at whether uh, people have an, a medical, uh, an MD, or, a, or they're, if they're an osteopath, um, and no real difference there in the early career uh, physicians uh, based on which kind of program they went to. But um, in the mid to late career physicians, you can see uh, that a lower proportion of the graduates of rural programs are MDs. So in other words, more of them are osteopaths. Um, and that fits with what we know about uh, the, the fact that osteopathic uh, medical schools often produce more rural uh, physicians. Um, and so going into rural training as well. In terms of the international medical graduates, um, there is a significant difference among the early career physicians. About 10% more of the rural program graduates are international medical graduates uh, as opposed to US medical school graduates compared to their urban program counterparts. There was no difference uh, among the uh, mid to late career physicians there. And you can also see an increasing proportion of international medical graduates. Um, if you look at uh, the mid to late career physicians, just 16% of them uh, versus 34 to 44% of, um, of the early career physicians are IMGs. We also looked at uh, whether physicians were um, underrepresented in me medicine historically. And those groups include um, Black or African American, American Indian or Alaska Native, uh, Native Hawaiian, and, uh, or other Pacific Islander physicians, and then or any you know if it's uh, multiple multiple races, any combination, including those, um, also includes Latino or Hispanic um, ethnicity, um, and so that's our measure of uh, you know or, or our indicator if someone is underrepresented in medicine. That wasn't asked in the early career uh, survey, but it was asked. Uh, of the um, mid to late career physicians. And you can see uh, a lower percentage of the graduates from rural programs are um, underrepresented in medicine compared to the urban graduates. So now let's look at what did we find in terms of um, where folks are practicing. Um, and um, probably not surprisingly, uh, we found uh, first of all that the rural graduates um, are more often found in under-resourced practice sites. And by that, I mean um, FQHCs, rural health clinics, or IHS sites. Um, and that difference is mostly carried through the rural health clinics, um, which you know, shouldn't be surprising. So of those rural program graduates who are in, in an under-resourced practice site, over half of them, 57%, are in rural health clinics, um, but also significant proportions in um, FQHCs a smaller number in uh, Indian Health Services uh, sites. And then um, in terms of rural practice, um, um, we found about that rural residency program graduates are about three times as likely as the urban ones to end up 
um, in a rural location, um, just about half of them, 51% compared to 17%. And then looking at the, the mid to late career physicians, same uh, sort of analysis, um, we found very similar patterns. So more rural program graduates are in under-resourced sites and about three times as many of them are in rural locations compared to the urban program graduates, 53%. And interestingly too, um, if you remember, there, it was about half of the early career physicians were in rural um, and that uh, proportion is remarkably stable here. So um, we find that there's some staying power uh, this is not a longitudinal analysis, so these are different groups that we're looking at, um, but, um, but it was um, interesting to see that roughly similar proportions of these older physicians are still uh, in rural places, or maybe some of them went back to rural after being in urban, went back to their roots, another possibility. Um, and then the last uh, uh, piece that I wanted to present, so here, um, those past analyses were just looking at, you know, breaking out rural versus urban, but we wanted to do a multivariate analysis to control for all those factors that I mentioned earlier, age, sex, and so on, um, to see, you know, how these different groups compared. So, and what we find was, uh, what we found was um, that the, both the early career and the mid to late career physicians had about five times the odds or more than five times the odds of choosing rural practice compared to their urban program uh, graduates uh, counterparts. And likewise, um, both of these groups who trained in rural residencies uh, had higher odds of being in a resource practice site, as you can see there by the odds ratios of 1.6 and 1.8. So, um, so even controlling for all those factors, um, these, these uh, overall practice outcome findings are uh, stable and um, and very solid. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Lars uh, to do his part of uh, the presentation. All right. Well, thanks, Davis. Um, so I'm going to cover family physician scope of practice. Um, so next slide, Davis. So one of the questions you hear often in research training and people discussing research is kind of, so what and who cares? So why do you care what family physicians are doing? Um, you heard from Davis earlier that you might care if you're a pregnant woman in a rural county because you want to know who's going to deliver your baby. Um, but in a more broader sense, um, the two figures on this slide are, represent work done by Barbara Starfield, who is a pediatrician who actually did um, a lot of health services research and work defining primary care. And both of these look across different countries. Um, so there's 10 kind of high ranking, high economic countries here. And two of them, one of them is a primary care score ranking. So you wanna be that way on that slide, you know, higher up where the United Kingdom is, is number one. And the other one with the primary care score, you wanna be higher. Um, so there's two different ways of looking at, you know, the strength of primary care within a country. And the point of one of the slides shows that health outcomes are better, the higher your rank in primary care. Um, so if you have more resources and investment in your health system in primary care, populations are healthier. Uh, the other slide with the dollar expenditures shows that the more investment you have in primary care, the stronger your primary care system is, the lower your health expenditures. With, of course, the United States being the outlier way up top. Um, and there's also evidence uh, that we've published in the ABFM showing that family physicians who um, do primarily outpatient care, but also deliver babies or do inpatient medicine have lower odds of burnout as well. I mean, those, you know, better, lower costs, better health outcomes, lower rates of burnout or better um, kind of clinician wellness, or, you know, I think at least three of the four aims of the quadruple aim, um, which is now being turned into a quintuple aim. So I think hopefully that convinces you that this is something we should care about uh, for populations and also for the people providing care. Um, next slide, Davis. Well, and then uh, more specific to the uh, United States, uh, with my collaborators at the Robert Graham Center, we published a paper a few years ago using Medicare data for family physicians and showing that using either the Medicare claims data or from the physicians in the study linking to what they told the ABFM they were doing on these exam registration questionnaires, either way you looked at what they were doing, so the broader their scope of practice or the more things they were doing, 
uh, their patients had lower odds of hospitalization in that year and also lower healthcare costs. So there is a direct benefit you can see in the United States as well. Um, next slide, please. However, we've also been publishing data for you know, over a decade showing that there's a decline in the scope of practice of family physicians that we've witnessed through our data and some other sources. And the two slides on the top, going back to Davis's um, discussion about maternity care and who's delivering babies in rural areas, um, the figure one on the upper right, uh, or upper left, I guess, uh, shows a decline in that about a quarter of family physicians were delivering a baby at the turn of the century. And that went down to, you know, lower than 10% um, by 2010. And that's further gone down to about six and a half percent now. And the figure to the right of it shows when you break that down by volume, it's a lot of the low volume um, delivery or physicians are uh, stopping delivering babies. But yet at highest volumes, if you're delivering over 50 babies per year, that actually has dropped as well in the last few years, showing that we are kind of getting out of the baby baby game. Um, and the slides on the bottom uh, look at inpatient care. So the proportion of family physicians doing inpatient care has also gone down uh, about from about 30, a third to a quarter over the last few years, according to our data. And then the other slide is looking at the percent caring for children. It's also gone down, things you think that part of being a family, taking care of the kids. Um, next slide, Davis. And yet, while we know, while we have evidence the scope is going down at large, um, we have lots of evidence showing that rural family docs do more, um, which makes a little bit of sense um, looking at the information that Davis presented and also looking at the you know, prevalence of specialists. Um, you're far less likely to find you know, neurologists and dermatologists, um, et cetera, in rural areas in addition to who's doing primary care like Davis showed. And that is part of what goes into family physicians doing more across you know, 20 different items on the figure to the left that we um, presented in a, one of our studies from a few years ago, showing that family physicians did everything more than rural or than urban physicians, except taking care of adults, which you know, over 98% of them did. And then also uh, our colleagues at the University of Iowa Rural Health Research Center also published data using Medicare claims showing that um, family physicians also did more. Um, and the more rural you go, um, they also were doing more across a range of services and also sites of settings. So next slide, please, Davis. So we then uh, were able to get funding from HRSA, uh, from the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy, to look at this in a little more depth through some of the data that ABFM collects on uh, family physicians in the scope of practice rural versus urban, and then also looked at whether or not you were in a patient-centered medical home in a rural area, if that was associated with having a broader scope of practice. And the other two studies there I will present uh, a little later. So uh, next slide. So you've heard Davis explain this a little bit uh, already. So we did uh, use data from the American Board of Family Medicine examination registration questionnaires. And I'm doing this myself next month. I have to take my exam. It's been that long since I finished residency. Um, as part of the process since the 80s, you, you know, have to verify your training and kind of pick your test center. And part of that has been questionnaires about, you know, are you still practicing medicine? You know, still seeing patients? What's your practice like? Where is your practice? Uh, what your scope of practice is like? And there's a core set of questions that everyone gets. And then to get more data, but also um, limit uh, the burden on our physicians of collecting this, we introduce kind of a rotating question set where like 20 or 25%, kind of depending on the year, get an additional question set. And we use some data on additional procedures um, and additional, anyway, additional scope items and procedural care uh, for the rural health policy brief that we'll discuss. And then uh, one of the main outcomes is a scope of practice score using those kind of how many things you're doing. Um, and it's scaled from zero to 30 with a higher score indicating a broader scope of practice. And then uh, from that exam registration questionnaire, we got a self-report of whether or not you have your practice was a patient-centered medical home. And then of course we collect practice address and you're able to geocode it um, to county level or um, yeah, county level or other uh, geographies. And these are all county level. Um, next slide, Davis. And this is largely repeating kind of uh, what Davis showed. Um, rural family physicians uh, tend to be slightly older, more likely to be male, um, more likely to be MD and less likely to be IMGs. I was, since Davis already hit that, I'll say next slide, please. And so this is uh, straight out of the um, 
policy brief that we um, wrote as part of this, which is available, of course, on the Gateway, um, and also from the Rural and Underserved Health Research Center's site. And so what this shows is looking at the county level geography of metropolitan is blue and then large rural, small rural and frontier using the rural urban continuum codes. Um, looking at the color scheme for each of these 20 uh, services or so, you can see the general pattern is to go blue the smallest and as you get more rural, the percent doing each of these services goes up near universally across the board. A few kind of weird twinges as you get more rural, there's some uh, variation, but largely it's increasing as you go. And then force from the bottom um, to verify internally, it's nice when data is consistent, um, force from the bottom is obstetrical care for delivering babies. And you see um, for what Davis showed you, same finding as you go more rural, more family physicians are delivering babies there. Um, next slide, Davis. And the numbers, so this is using data from that rotating question set, um, looking at more specific um, procedures and uh, particularly women's health procedures like doing um, or putting in uh, IUDs or long acting reversible contraception like Nexplanon, um, circumcisions, et cetera. And you can see the same general pattern tends to hold. Uh, rural docs tend to do more and including hospital-based procedures like you know, central lines is down there fourth from bottom and paracentesis, lumbar punctures, um, et cetera, more likely to do them if you are in a rural area. Um, next slide. And then looking to see whether or not you're in a patient-centered medical home supported broad scope of practice, which you hope it would, it's supposed to be giving extra financial support and extra resources for primary care. So you're taking care of more in your medical home and don't have to be referred out or have other physicians providing your care. As you can see, this is taking those scope items from a couple, um, two slides ago, and just kind of comparing within rural only, if you're in a rural area, so the blue or the large rural areas, small rural is orange, and kind of the frontier is gray, looking at the kind of delta, if you are in a PCMH this way, and then a non-PCM, and if you're not in a PCMH the other way, and across the board, regardless of how rural you are, if you are in a patient-centered medical home, you do provide more services, each of the ones we ask, um, somewhere between you know, two and 20% more than if you're not in a patient-centered medical home. But the ones that stand out, of course, on the top is um, inpatient care, which I thought was interesting that in frontier areas, uh, you're less likely to do hospital medicine if you're a patient-centered medical home. Um, but other, other than that, most of the things are higher in a patient-centered medical home in a rural area, indicating that that uh, program at least is working for supporting family physicians doing broad scope care. Um, next slide, please, Davis. Lars, if I can interrupt just for a oh, minute and yes. go, back, go backwards one more slide. Um, the question is, what is the breakout for cancer care services on figure four? Yeah, we don't, have, we don't ask specifically about uh, cancer care. Um, whether or not they're providing follow-up care or, um, I don't, well, I guess it's because I, I see the question in the chat. I'm not sure if it's about like, obviously cancer treatment is usually done by an oncologist, but if it's like follow-up care or screening or diagnosis um, would be kind of a different question. And we actually do have um, one of our current projects with the World Underserved Health Research Center is actually looking at uh, colorectal cancer screening in rural urban practices. So we have some information coming about on that, coming out on that next year. And I think to Mark's question in the chat, I think that's actually covered in our, uh, <laughs> in this slide um, about global scope of practice about um, hospital. So this, um, so the student I mentioned, uh, Arouge, actually came to me from, as an undergrad from the University of Kentucky and read some of the studies from the Rural Health Research Center that I just went over and came to me and said, well, you know, Dr. Peterson, I noticed, you know, that scope of practice is going down in family physicians, but rural scope of practice is higher. Have you not looked like, is this largely an urban phenomenon or is scope of practice also going down in rural areas? And so uh, she helped us do that project and write the paper they got just published in the latest issue of the Journal of Rural Health. And this is using that scope score that goes from zero to 30. Um, so higher scope, um, or higher scope is a higher score. And we use data that were consistent from 2014 to 2016. And um, the top slide shows all settings kind of over time um, that scope is going down a little bit. So 0.5 on a 30 point scale, but significant um, and bivariate comparisons. 
And then looking across uh, those rural urban divides, it's going down you know, much more in metropolitan areas. And then in rural areas, there's some evidence that tends to be trending to go down, but if sample size is not significant in bivariate testing. And then the adjusted change looks at um, putting all data together, you know, kind of showing again, adjusting for things like uh, Mark mentioned in the comments, whether or not you have a hospital in your um, county, supply of other physicians, uh, some social economics, et cetera, that in controlling for those things, uh, scope of practice is larger in rural areas. And to the question of, is it changing over time? We actually did an interaction of rural by time or year and found that, that term was not significant, indicating that kind of over time scope of practice is staying the same um, in rural areas um, and not uh, going down. So it's largely an urban phenomenon. Um, but when we break things out of the scope score and look at our individual things changing, um, it's the next slide, Davis. Um, we do find that there are some significant changes in um, specific services in some of the areas. And I just pulled out a few of these. You can, can read the paper to get the full results um, of emergency care, inpatient care declining slightly, et cetera. Um, but when you compare this list to the next slide that shows all the services that are declining in urban areas, <laughs> Oh, next slide, Davis. You see it's double the size. Um, so there's a lot more decline in of larger magnitude um, in urban areas of family physicians. And uh, next slide, please, Davis. And then uh, one of the other kind of offshoot bonus studies we did was look at a specific set of services that can be used for um, cancer screening, at least the colonoscopy and flexible sigmoidoscopy. And then endoscopy is you know, going down your mouth and your stomach to look for um, some other things. And family physicians can do these general surgeons. People think generally or usually of a GI or a gastroenterologist doing them. But just looking at rural and urban, because the sample size has got kind of small because um, this is one of those rotating question sets that a subsample get. And we did show that there's a decline um, in rural areas of physicians doing these, which could indicate um, lower access to um, screening services potentially. And as I mentioned, we have a project, current project looking at that right now. Um, so with that, uh, next slide, Davis, and I guess I'll hand back to you. Okay, thank you, Lars. Uh, so uh, we're just going to wrap up here with uh, some concluding points. And so um, first off, um, thinking about the supply overall, um, you know, as, as we both mentioned, family physicians are critically important for rural health systems, and they are more concentrated with increasing rurality. And I wanted to give a shout out to this um, publication uh, recent publication by Lars, Lars and others um, in his group um, in the Journal of Rural Health that looks at uh, not just family physicians, but other specialties as well by rurality. Um, I think the, the big caution um, when we look at national estimates, you know, that really gives us an incomplete picture. So we we need to examine different types of rural areas, and and certainly some of that has come up in the chat with, uh, you know, thinking about frontier areas versus other types of rural areas, um, and then you know we we need to look at subnational, state level, sub-state level, um, and and those of you who who work um, recruiting within states, like if some of you are in in state offices of rural health, you know all about the needs of different areas in your states and. Um, how rural can look different from one place to the other. And then the other thing I, I think is time trends is really important to, to track. And Lars um, hinted at that, at that or, or addressed that um, very effectively, but also just looking at supply over time. And our center um, has a couple of projects where we're going to be tracing uh, clinician supply, not just physicians, but other uh, also other types of health professionals um, over time uh, and just to kind of to take a global assessment of where we're where we've been and where we're going, um, but in this set of studies, uh, you know, we saw that family physicians are more concentrated in non-core counties overall, um, and those non-core counties, at the same time, seemingly seemingly paradoxically, um, were also more likely uh, than metro and micropolitan counties to have no family physicians. So again, um, it, it really depends on where you are on the ground. Um, 
And then in more rural places, um, family physicians do provide more OB care. But as Lars mentioned, the supply of, of family physicians who are delivering babies is steadily declining over time. And, and that trend has been going on for, for some time, um, which is quite concerning. In terms of um, the, the training, uh, you know, we found that over half of rural program graduates choose rural practice, and that's about three times the yield from rural programs. Um, and, uh, you know, ur urban program grad graduates are also very important for, uh, they're an important supply as well for um, rural places, uh, and there are many more of them. But if you really want to invest in the places where uh, people are going to choose rural practice, um, that means shifting our uh, investments from urban uh, academic medical centers to rural places um, that can do a better job of of training physicians for their communities. And so um, uh, that's a really key takeaway. Um, we also found that rural programs produce higher proportions of physicians serving under resource communities and, and principally through rural health clinics, not surprising. And these patterns were remarkably, were remarkably stable at different stages of, of people's careers. Mark? Yeah. And yeah, and then for scope of practice, as mentioned, you know, the overall scope is decreasing um, of what family physicians are doing. But um, while urban, while rural family physicians do more, um, there's some evidence that their care might be narrowing as well, even though, um, which can threaten uh, patient access to care. And that we know that patients and populations do better when primary care is high functioning. This is also concerning. So we want people to have access to good, high quality primary care. And that also that payment models and health systems should incentivize rural training uh, to produce rural physicians who do more and also support uh, ways in which family physicians and other primary care clinicians can provide, you know, higher, higher scope care um, and to meet healthcare needs. And I guess with that, next slide. And just like to, again, as Davis said at the beginning, thank the Gateway for having us. Uh, it's been fun. This is my first one of these. And I think with and then also our contact information for Davis and I are there. And I believe we are going to pause now and take any questions that, the, that you have. Yeah, we'll pause for a moment and take a look um, at the I chat just, box. Oh, yeah, sorry, Davis. <laughs> oh, yeah, I just wanted to note, so Mark's comment about uh, not just shifting training from urban to rural. And, and absolutely, you know, our, our work here that we're presenting today was sort of more fo focused on the later part of the of the um, educational trajectory, but absolutely, um, you know, finding those, finding and developing and supporting uh, rural education systems uh, from, you know, from K all the way up K through 12 into community colleges and college um, and, and developing those rural um, students and then uh, supporting them. Um, I, so I completely agree uh, with your comment there, Mark. Oh, okay. And, uh, go ahead, Lars. Oh, yeah. And I was just trying to click on see if how I could see the whole name. It just said J. All I could see was Jeff, but uh, to Dr. Dockery. Um, yeah, so we do have... There have been a few studies that we've gone. So on some of the questionnaires in the last few years, we asked the question, you know, do you provide inpatient care or OB care? And then if you don't, we ask why not? Um, and so we've published work on OB, but not the hospital-based questions yet. Um, but you can look them up on our website. We do post the entire graduate survey results for each year on the ABFM website. And there is evidence that a lot of physicians early career, and even we've asked the later career docs now, and we say, um, you know, why aren't you delivering these services? One of the more common reasons is having difficulty finding a job that offers them. That's, and then we do have a, one of the questions about difficulty getting privileges, which has been more of an issue for OB, for family physicians wanting to do OB than um, inpatient care. But that does kind of get to our health systems or hospitals kind of you know, limiting what family physicians can do. And I, we've been kind of chasing that a little bit. We don't have quite have a smoking gun for that yet. Um, we've been thinking about how to approach that, but there, that is kind of an anecdotal concern that we hear and kind of suspect, but again, we're working on trying to get data to investigate that.
I also see the the uh, question about using a metric uh, such as the primary care year, which which Bob Bowman has advocated for. Um, and we actually did a study uh, where we compared uh, the the sort of the longer trajectories of how you know how much time um, when someone graduates from a rural versus an urban residency, how much time do they actually spend? practicing in rural versus urban areas, so a more longitudinal approach, um, and did find, uh, again, that the, the rural, rurally trained folks um, contributed significantly more in terms of years of practice uh, in rural, but we did not compare to other types of physicians or PAs and NPs, and I think that's an excellent uh, suggestion um, if we can track down the data, which is one of the challenges in, in workforce research that we don't always have the data sets that allow us to, to take a deep dive into some of these issues, but I think that's an excellent um, suggestion to compare to other, other types of uh, clinicians. And, and I do love when your own center director starts throwing questions at you in your own talk from your own work so tie. I see it's put a question in the chat about why should we support local primary care when um, there are pe people who, you know, there is a phenomenon of rural of bypass um, for primary care services and other services as well. Um, just as, from my own personal experience, I still practice, you know, still practicing, see patients two afternoons a week at University of Kentucky, and I have a patient from Hazard who drives, you know, has to drive by a couple hundred family docs to see me in Lexington and University of Kentucky even has like a resident, you know, rural residency in Hazard. Like you could go see the University of Kentucky brand there, but chooses to drive in and get primary care from me, which I, you know, he didn't start that because of me. I inherited him from someone else. Um, so I do, it is a challenge to um, arrange care for people, like when they have a lot of other kind of needs and see specialists and that coordination function of primary care, um, that is difficult to do um, from afar. So I would say it is better to get your care local. And then, but trying to change local hearts and minds, you know, growing up in a rural area, um, and I always bring my mom up for this, right? Because when she thought, when I told her I wanted to be a rural family doc and come back to the town where I grew up, she even had this own kind of like, well, no one good comes here. Like, you know, if you're any good, you'd be somewhere else. And I, and I do, you know, haven't lived in a rural area since I was a younger person, but I, I've heard that kind of mindset before about, you know, the services we have can't be as good as they are in the city. So we need to bypass or like, you know, go get better care somewhere else. And I kind of wonder if some of that cultural aspect plays into that and how we can change that mindset. Because I you know, we have data that shows, you know, the, if you want a really good family doc, a lot of them are in rural areas. So I don't know if you have any comments or if you have any comments about that, Davis, or. Well, I guess I'd add to that. I mean, certainly um, some people have the ability to travel, many don't. So many people can't travel. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, you know, that loss of rural health resources in smaller communities um, is a greater loss than just the, the health care. Um, and, you know, people often talk about economics, but, uh, you know, many of many rural clinicians are really beloved in their communities and they, they, they serve other key roles and they, they bring other important resources to these communities. So, um, so I think, uh, and, you know, we could dig further into the reasons why uh, folks travel um, and, you know, reputational, uh, uh, perceptions may be part of it, which is really unfortunate uh, for just the reason that you mentioned, Lars. And so I think we need to combat, combat the perception that we don't have good health care around here um, when um, that may just not be the case. So we yeah, have a, it, sorry, Lars, we have just a couple of minutes remaining here. I'm going to very briefly demonstrate how to find research on the Gateway website, and then we'll cycle back one last time in case there are any last questions. So I'm going to steal the screen share from you here, Davis. So this is the Rural Health Research Gateway homepage. Now at the top of the page, there's a blue toolbar. And here you'll find an About Us tab to learn more about Gateway and to learn more about all of the rural health research centers. There is a Browse Research tab, and you can find research by topic. You can search all the publications on Gateway. 
You can learn more about the current and completed research projects that our centers are working on. And you can even browse research by individual researchers. So we're gonna click on this research publication button here. Now on this page, you can see the five most recent publications that are published on Gateway. And you have the ability to browse by date, topic, center, and researcher. So we're gonna browse by date. And these are all of the publications that have been published in 2021. There are 62 research publications featured on Gateway. And if you wanna find publications from previous years, you can find those on the right side of the screen. And we have publications dating back all the way to 1996. So if you wanna find something about today's presentation, like the primary care workforce, you can type that into the search box at the top of the screen and you'll have the ability to sort by relevance or by date. So we'll select date. And you can narrow, narrow your search by center, other projects, publications, or webinars. So we're gonna select publications here. And you can see that Gateway has research on the general surgery workforce, on nurse practitioner autonomy, on the supply and distribution of the primary care workforce. And that sounds very familiar, so we'll click on this. You'll see a brief description of the publication, the center responsible for the publication, the authors of the publication. And at the top, there is a link to view policy brief. All you have to do is click on this link and you have free access once it loads. We'll try it one more time, sorry about that. Well, you will have free access to this policy brief. It might download to your browser as a PDF instead of opening up in a new tab. So that's how easy it is to find research on Gateway. Now, if you wanna stay up to date on webinars, uh, you can click on the webinar tab and see upcoming webinars. You'll find archived webinars. And if you want to stay up to date on the latest research, you can click on the research alert tab, enter your name and email, and you'll be subscribed to our listserv. You'll be notified about upcoming webinars, and you can see some of our newest research here. We've had recent publications on hospital quality star ratings, on breast cancer stage at diagnosis, and on statewide age-friendly initiatives. So finally, if you want to see Key findings as you browse through social media, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter at RHR Gateway. So with that, if there's any further questions, we can check the chat box one last time. And I don't see any further questions. Lars or Davis, do you have anything else to add? Um, I guess at the top of the hour, just thanks to the Rural Health Gateway and thanks to the HRSA and the Federal Office of Rural Health Policy for funding us and all the kind of impressed 140 or so people who showed up today to watch this live. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Davis. Thank you, everyone, for being here. And I Thank you very you much. Hope to see you all at future Gateway webinars. Have a nice day, everybody.